Good morning, bonjour, bon dia. Welcome to the WHO Africa Media Briefing, which is taking place in collaboration with the APO Group. First, some housekeeping. We have interpretation in English and French. Please go to the right hand uh, bottom of your screen and select uh, the click on the globe icon and select the language you prefer. Yasmina, please. Oui, bonjour à tous et merci de nous avoir rejoints à cette conférence de presse de l'OMS. Si vous souhaitez écouter la conférence en français, merci de cliquer sur l'icône en forme de globe qui est située en bas de l'écran à droite. Merci. Thank you, Yasmina. So today, uh, the just, um, she just have an emergency this morning and uh, she says her sincere apologies, she's not able to join us. So she's really sorry about this. So in her place, we have Dr. of University of to introduce our remaining panelists. Okay, uh, good morning and good afternoon to all journalist colleagues participating in this press conference on COVID-19 in Africa, including the vaccine rollout. I'm very pleased to be joined for this conversation by Professor Jean-Jacques Mouyembe, the Director General of the National Institute for Biomedical Research in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Technical Secretary of the National Multisectoral Committee for the response to COVID-19. He will speak about vaccine rollouts in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Professor, bienvenue à cette session. I'm also happy to welcome Dr. Gitindi Gitahi, the Group Chief Executive Officer for Armref Health Africa who will share with us how communities are responding to the lack of access to vaccines. The current surge in new COVID-19 cases in Africa is easing off, but with 108,000 new cases, more than 3,000 lives lost in the past week, and 16 countries still in researches, this fight is far from over health workers, services, and communities can and should use this time to regroup and prepare for the next wave. Within, with end of year travel and festive celebrations fast approaching, fresh increases in cases should be expected in the coming months. Without widespread vaccination and other public and social measures, the continent's fourth wave is likely to be the worst, the most brutal yet. Yesterday, I joined governments and private sector leaders, international organizations and other partners for the global COVID-19 summit convened by the United States. Everyone in attendance committed to three goals, vaccinate the world, save lives now and build back better. This is the kind of international solidarity that will help to end this pandemic. The United States and governments attending the summit put forward a number of concrete actions, including for countries to urgently convert those sharing pledges into deliveries and for all countries to vaccinate at least 70% of their population by 2022. They also called for solutions to solve the oxygen crisis, to eliminate the testing gap, and to make sure all countries have access to safe and effective therapeutics. This amplifies the message that we as WHO have been promoting throughout the pandemic, along with the growing number of our global health advocates. What is needed now are strong accountability mechanisms to ensure 
these targets translate into real and concrete results in countries and that promises made are promises kept on sharing vaccines. You will agree with me that actions speak far louder than words. Global coordination mechanisms are needed to bring together vaccine producing nations, manufacturers, international organizations and other stakeholders to promote transparency on vaccine delivery schedules and sharing of other key critical information. This will help countries to plan and roll out the vaccines efficiently. A key finding from the interaction reviews in our countries of the rollout to date is that the instability caused by inconsistent vaccine supply is negatively impacting vaccine uptake. At the same time, we know that vaccine supplies are increasing. So our message to countries is really to get ready, get ready by strengthening the capacities required to pick up the pace of vaccination. WHO teams are in the field to closely work with our partners and countries to accelerate this pace. For the rollout so far, we're starting to see what works and what does not work. What works is something like the approaches such as diversifying vaccination sites bring, and bringing them to places that people frequent regularly, like churches, mosques, or markets. Getting information close to the community through religious leaders, women and youth groups, leveraging networks that are already well established and that community trust. These are some of the things that we see are working in countries. Financing remains vital, including international mechanisms to facilitate rapid access to the catalytic funds that will help countries to roll out the vaccines faster. As it stands, one in three people globally are fully vaccinated against COVID-19. But in Africa, this drops to one in 25. COVAX deliveries are still coming into African countries, with 4 million doses arriving in the past week. These shipments are greatly appreciated, but it's concerning that only a third of the doses pledged by the end of 2021 have been received. The pace of vaccination in Africa must rise by other seven times to around 150 million per month on average to meet the global goal of vaccinating 70% of every country's population. This is huge, and it will need to be accompanied in equal access by adequate delivery capacities, staff, supplies, funding to massively ramp up the rollout. It is in every country's interest that this happens quickly. The longer the delay in rolling out the vaccines, the greater the risk of additional challenges emerging, be they variants, hesitancy, operational gaps, or other threats. So I look forward to our fruitful discussion today and thank you very much for joining us. Back to you, Mary. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Benito, for that uh, elaborate um, introduction. Um, to you, Professor Muyambe, can you please tell us uh, the challenges that the DRC is facing in terms of vaccine deployment? Kindly uh, also highlight the importance of uh, uh, which countries delivering on their promises to, uh, that they have made in terms of vaccine shipments. Professor Muyambe, please. Uh, merci beaucoup pour uh, la parole. Et comme vous savez, eh, la COVID-19 est une crise globale avec des conséquences au-delà du secteur de la santé. La solution à cette crise doit aussi être globale. La vaccination est l'une des solutions pourvu qu'elle soit équitable et atteigne toutes les populations exposées. Or, les données actuelles 
montrent que la vaccination n'est pas équitable. Certaines régions de la planète sont plus vaccinées que d'autres. Les pays africains sont victimes de cette inégalité vaccinale due entre autres, due entre autres au non-respect des engagements des pays riches qui, au travers du mécanisme COVAX, avaient promis de, soutien, de soutenir la disponibilité de vaccins aux pays à ressources limitées comme les pays africains. C'est ici l'occasion de rappeler aux pays riches de matérialiser leurs promesses concernant l'appui aux vaccins. Comme disait le docteur Tetros, directeur général de l'OMS, l'inégalité en matière de vaccins est le principal obstacle qui empêche le monde de mettre fin à cette pandémie et de s'en relever. Alors, les défis que mon pays présente, ce sont les défis qui sont liés surtout euh, sur le plan de la communication. Il y a une forte résistance de la population euh, qui est liée à l'infodémie. Et comme vous le savez, euh, cette pandémie survient au moment où les réseaux sociaux jouent un rôle très important euh, dans la communication. Euh, le deuxième défi, c'est l'utilisation des vaccins avec une date de validité très courte. La population considère la, la courte validité des trois mois euh, de certains vaccins euh, comme euh, synonyme de mauvaise qualité. Alors, la population n'adhère pas, n'est-ce pas, à ce vaccin. Un autre défi, c'est l'indisponibilité des coûts opérationnels. Quand les vaccins sont arrivés, il fallait mettre ça en, en, en il fallait les distribuer sur le terrain. Et comme vous savez, la RDC, c'est un pays très vaste. Et pour atteindre le point et le point du pays, il faut beaucoup de moyens. Il faut beaucoup de moyens. Et ces moyens manquaient au moment où les vaccins, n'est-ce pas, sont arrivés, ou même le décaissement des de fonds mobilisés était vraiment très faible. Alors, l'autre défi, c'est le faible engagement politique. Euh, parfois, des, des hommes politiques émettent des messages qui n'encouragent pas la population à adhérer à la vaccination. Donc, tous ces éléments mis ensemble, nous avons eu des freins vraiment à mettre en pratique, à, à déployer, euh, les vaccins euh, sur euh, le terrain. Et donc, il y a un effort considérable à faire de la part d'abord des pays riches qui doivent disponibiliser, n'est-ce pas, les vaccins et de la part, n'est-ce pas, des autorités locales, des citoyens que nous sommes pour sensibiliser la population et euh, rompre ces, ces défis, cette hésitation qu'a la population pour recevoir le vaccin. Et tous ces mécanismes que euh, le prédécesseur a, a cité, donc euh, l'utilisation des influenceurs, euh, les églises, les, 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 les sociétés civiles, euh, tout ça c'est très important, mais il faut arriver donc à les convaincre et à mettre en, en place tous les mécanismes pour euh, que la population accepte euh, la vaccination. Merci. Merci de m'écouter. Merci beaucoup, professeur Mouyambe. And to you, Dr. Uh, Gitahi, please tell us about the impact of vaccine scarcity on communities in Africa and what your reflections are on the outcome of uh, President Biden's global COVID-19 summit. Thank you very much, uh, Mary, and thank you um, to the participants, Dr. Manido and Professor Moyembe. Uh, uh, very quickly, the first thing is obviously that um, the COVID-19 pandemic has been, has been reflected, has affected communities significantly. Uh, we know that the economies are suffering, women have lost jobs, men have lost jobs, there has been rising 
uh, gender-based violence, rising teenage pregnancy related to school closures that are following the waves. And this will continue to go on until we can vaccinate the African people. So the way to actually socioeconomic recovery for the continent is to vaccinate rapidly. And I think this is what has been reflected on, uh, you know, in the previous conversations. Right now, only uh, about 6% uh, of our people across the continent have actually had uh, the chance of getting a dose of a vaccine. And uh, yet the continent carries about 17% of the global population. So this is holding back a significant part of the population through all these challenges, including um, uh, the challenges that we have seen of a high case fatality. I was looking at data recently that shows that case fatality in Europe, if you look at the average case fatality or in terms of number of deaths related to the number of reported positive cases, it has dropped by almost 67%. If you look at the average versus the current case fatality uh, post uh, vaccinating almost 60% of the population. So we know that vaccines work, but the African case fatality rate remains above the global average, remains at about 2.5%. Yet we know that in communities, there are many unrecorded positive cases. There are many unrecorded deaths that happen as community. Not many of us understand that the people who get recorded as positive or uh, as positive of COVID or having died are those who are visible. Many people are not visible because they couldn't afford a test or they couldn't afford to seek care. As you know, Africa doesn't have universal uh, access to health services. That's why we are fighting for universal health coverage uh, together with WHO. Uh, globally and even near WHO Afro is because the people they get sick, they don't seek care because they can't pay. So many who die at home because they had you know, low oxygen and they didn't go to the hospital and they collapse at home, don't get reported in hospital statistics in many of the countries. They get reported as, as cases of the police because they need to investigate the cause of death. And because we don't have widespread COVID testing, post-mortem COVID testing in Africa, we miss many days that are related to COVID-19 that we will never know because they died and they were taken to the mortuary by police because they died at home. This is the continuing socioeconomic pandemic. And the way to end it is to vaccinate as many Africans as rapidly as possible, which then uh, brings me to the point about the summit that you asked. You know, within the, you know, in the summit, we had conversations regarding, as was said by uh, Dr. Benito around vaccinating the world, uh, saving lives now, and also building back better. And the many pledges were made, including an addition of 500 million doses pledged from the US government, from President Biden. That brings the total pledges by the US government to about 1.1 billion. I think the key concerns are that these doses need to come now. We know that the previous um, you know, 500 million doses that were pledged by um, the US government only about 1.5 million of them have been delivered. And therefore the new pledge needs to be on the back of delivery of the old pledge because a vaccine delayed is a vaccine denied. Uh, community people are dying as they wait. So we don't want this death to continue. We want the vaccine to come in time. And as Professor Mwembe has said, we want the vaccine to come in time and long dated, not short dated because when they are short dated, they put pressure on the vaccine delivery system. Therefore, the first thing to say out of this particular um, uh, summit is that we appreciate all this, uh, you know, the, the donations that were, uh, were pledged by the rich countries and the, for those who, are, who have doses to offer. We truly appreciate that. But we call for commitment to deliver on those and also to deliver on them in a timely manner. Secondly, is that there was a commitment to raise $10 billion to enable vaccination efforts including overcoming hesitancy, uh, communicating as was reflected on earlier. Again, this needs to be done and done rapidly. The next point that was made is that these doses need to come through the COVID vaccine facility. It is extremely important that we prioritize the COVAX facility. The COVAX facility has so far delivered over 80 million doses in Africa, more than half of the doses that have been received here in Africa. It is important because the COVAX facility delivers the doses for free to governments as opposed to the efforts to actually give loans to countries to buy vaccines. We don't want to, in, to uh, increase the debt of countries on, based on purchasing vaccines when actually the COVAX facility has over $10 billion 
and they can purchase 4.5 billion doses if the rich countries can allow COVAX to come ahead of the queue. That should be a collective call. Allow COVAX to come ahead of the queue and then ensure that COVAX can purchase the doses and deliver them equitably to these countries. In terms of saving lives now, the reflection was largely around oxygen and all these things that are being donated. My insistence is that let us build local health systems because a nurse right now looking for oxygen will not call Global Fund, will not call WHO, will not call AMREF, will not call, will go to their local store and check whether oxygen is available. So we really need to strengthen local health systems, strengthen their local capacity to finance themselves and uh, strengthen community accountability mechanism. So we appreciate all the donations and commodities, but we want to call for building health systems. And that was my call at the summit yesterday. And finally, as I close, is on the area of building back better. I am concerned personally that we are trying to build new mechanisms while mechanisms already exist. The Global Health Threats Council, which was actually recommended during the summit, is a duplication of WHO. We want WHO to be supported to be the one that is handling global health threats and to be supported with funds so that even the suggested Global Health Security Financial Intermediary Fund, which is supposed was mentioned and uh, uh, supported at the summit that should have a seed funding of $10 billion. Should, and then there was a suggestion that that should go to Alban. I think the mechanism should be found for WHO and existing other mechanisms like Global Fund and others to be able to handle this fund so that we don't create new global architecture. We build and support existing global architecture. I would like to stop there and I'll talk more during the questions. Back to you, Mary. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gitahi. Uh, that call for vaccine equity and accessibility for African communities definitely is very important. So you have now heard uh, from all our panelists. It is now your time, journalists, to ask your questions. To do this, please use the Q&A function on the Zoom platform. Give us your name, the name of the news organization you have to have your questions asked. Uh, if you would like to go live, indicate on the Zoom platform as well. On hand to also ask, uh, answer your questions are uh, Dr. Tiano Baude, who is the incident manager here at the regional office for the COVID-19 response, and uh, Dr. Um, Richard uh, Mihigo, who is always here with us the immunization and vaccine development coordinator here at the regional office. So I would like to start with uh, Rhoda. I understand you want to ask your question live. Are you there? Mon uh, morning, Dr. Mary, yes, I'm here. So my question, my name is Rhoda Diambo from the BBC. My question can be answered by either Dr. Mihigo or Dr. Balde. Um, in regards to the UK's move uh, not recognizing vaccine certificates and the approved programs that African governments have put to roll out COVID-19 vaccines. What does the WHO make of this move? Because it looks like a trust issue. And the greater implication of this is that it will hurt the continent's vaccination uh, campaign. Okay, Dr. Richard, um, you can start and then Dr. Mwembe, uh, Dr. Benide, if you have, if you want to weigh in, uh, you can also uh, uh, weigh in after they have responded. Dr. Richard, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Mary, and uh, uh, thanks for uh, calling from BBC. I think we, uh, we we have to differentiate two things here, um, and and I think um, there have been some confusion in the in the press the last couple of uh, days uh, about this uh, announcement by the UK. Uh, first of all, uh, we need to uh, uh, mention that um, all the vaccines that are being supplied uh, uh, through COVAX uh, in the African region are uh, vaccines that are WHO um, uh, pre-qualified, that have received the emergency use list authorization by WHO. And these are the vaccines that are safe, efficient to uh, be rolled out uh, in, in the country. Part of these vaccines, as we have heard even from Dr. Gitai, uh, are vaccines that are coming through donation, including vaccines that are coming from the UK uh, and used in several other uh, countries uh, in this region. So we're not really here talking about the integrity of the vaccination programs in Africa. That has been a, a program uh, that has delivered 
very efficient vaccination uh, campaign uh, even before, before uh, COVID-19 uh, um, started. So I think on that side, we need to be very clear that uh, vaccination that are currently taking place in many countries, in all the countries in Africa, uh, follow the right procedure using the right vaccines uh, uh, to, to protect the people in Africa. Now, the issue of uh, vaccine certificates is completely a different issue. Um, and, and I think uh, that we need all collectively to work together to see how um, some of these certificates that are generated from countries uh, could be mutually recognized by different countries. I know that Africa CDC uh, uh, was working in collaboration with partners in WHO uh, in uh, uh, digitalizing some of these documents to make sure that people can move freely and the certificate that are produced by the countries are also trusted abroad. So as you said, it's mainly an issue of trust. And I think we need absolutely to work around that to make sure that those certificates that are generated from national program are genuine, are valid, and can be mutually recognized by other countries. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Muyambe. Oui, oui, euh, oui. Euh, voilà, je, je pense que euh, le fait que les vaccins euh, que nous recevons en Afrique sont des dons, euh, le, 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 la, 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 disons la population a une certaine méfiance pour dire est-ce que ces vaccins sont vraiment des vaccins sont les mêmes que les vaccins utilisés en Europe et, et ailleurs. Bon, nous, euh, en tant que scientifiques, nous disons que ces vaccins sont les mêmes, ont les mêmes capacités, ont, ce sont vraiment les mêmes vaccins homologués qui sont donnés ici en Afrique. C'est à nous, donc, les scientifiques, de convaincre les populations pour que la population adhère à la vaccination. Il n'y a vraiment pas de raison pour que les mauvais vaccins sont envoyés en Afrique et les bons vaccins restent, n'est-ce pas, en Europe. Il n'y a pas de raison pour cela. Donc, nous avons confiance en ces vaccins et euh, nous les donnons à notre population. Voilà. Thank you, Professor Muyambe. Dr. Benida, do you want to weigh in on this? Uh, Mary. I, I, I think there are discussions that, that, that are going on between uh, WHO and the UK government. Uh, we will make sure that uh, we closely work with uh, the UK government to ensure that uh, a solution can be found quickly to resolve this issue. So as soon as new, new information is made available, we'll be happy to share that with uh, 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 our partners, journalists, and member states. So that's what I can see at, uh, at this point in time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Benido. Daniel from CGTN, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Mary. Yes. yes, Mary, my question uh, goes out to WHO. Now, uh, many nurses are going through compassion fatigue uh, from repeated exposure to people suffering from COVID-19. Now, some of the nurses have unfortunately succumbed to the virus after being in contact with those who are still hesitant to get inoculated. Now, what can countries do to protect the lives of hundreds of healthcare workers who tirelessly put their lives on the line to save us. Okay, Dr. Benida, I will start with you. Then uh, uh, Dr. Richard and uh, Dr. Gita, he could compliment after you. Dr. Benido, please, you are muted. Th th okay. Thank you. I mean, th first of all, we, we need to recognize, the, to acknowledge the, the, the tremendous efforts being done by uh, uh, nurses across the continent to really make sure that they are taking care of uh, those who are sick. Uh, uh, 
that's something we need to, to really acknowledge and appreciate uh, the great work they've been doing over the past uh, uh, months. Now, in terms of what needs to be done at country level to ensure that we protect them, uh, we avoid these uh, burnouts. I think the first thing is really to uh, make sure that all the PPEs and other uh, uh, life-saving and protective commodities are available. When they need them, they should have it. And I think a lot of work has been done by uh, WHO member states and partners to make sure that they have those uh, critical life-saving uh, uh, commodities. So that's in terms of protection. But also in terms of uh, uh, training, I, I think a lot is going on to ensure that they are well trained. Uh, they, 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 they make sure that they, 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 they try to, I mean, we're trying to make sure that even in terms of uh, mental health, they are being supported. And then lastly, it's really in terms of uh, uh, in terms of making sure that uh, uh, adequate, I'll say, supplies and uh, psychological support uh, is given to them because uh, we've been closely working with our uh, member states to ensure that they get what they really need. And uh, that is work ongoing. And uh, WHO will uh, always be there to ensure that we also protect all these uh, healthcare workers while they are supporting uh, the, the ongoing COVID-19 response. Thank you, Dr. Benido. Dr. Gitahi, please, do you want to weigh in on this question? Yeah, uh, uh, thank you for that, Dr. Mary. And uh, the points made by Dr. Benido have my full support. I just want to add that if we can accelerate vaccination of health workers, ensure every single health worker is actually vaccinated, that is the best way to actually protect health workers because we have lost nurses, we've lost doctors, we've lost uh, you know, laboratory technologies, we've lost community health workers. So the biggest effort I would like to add there is to ensure they're all vaccinated and they're given priority in every country, but also to include overcoming their information concerns because even health workers have information concerns because not everyone understands vaccines uh, you know, the way some of us may understand them. So even those health workers need to be educated because also, once they, they have a full information on the vaccines, they also become key opinion shapers for the communities to overcome any doubts that may be there for vaccines. So I would just like to add that that's the next, uh, that should be our focus actually, in addition to everything that, that, that has been said. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gitahi. Um, Dr. Richard, you can add on that previous question, but I want to give you a question first. And uh, if you have addition, you can uh, compliment on the previous question as well. This question is from, from Delphine. Um, the question is, can you please tell us how African countries have reached, how many African countries have reached uh, the 10% vaccination target? Uh, you can answer this in French, please. Dr. Richard. Okay, merci. Uh... Merci beaucoup. Euh, non, pour euh, la, la question précédente, je pense que mes deux euh, euh, prédécesseurs ont, si, ont bien parlé, donc je, 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 je n'ai rien d'autre à ajouter. Et pour la question de Delphine, euh, juste que euh, les données euh, à la date d'hier nous montrent que 14 pays euh, dans la région africaine euh, ont à ce jour vacciné euh, plus de 10 euh, de la population de manière euh, complète. Nous sommes à une semaine de la fin de ce premier milestone important qui est fin septembre 2021, où tous les pays sont censés avoir vacciné jusqu'à 10 Donc, nous espérons que dans les jours qui viennent, avant fin septembre, nous aurons probablement deux à trois autres pays qui pourront dépasser la barre de 10 de la population complètement vaccinée. Malheureusement, la majorité des pays dans notre région ne vont pas, ne vont pas atteindre cet objectif. Et nous avons encore de, de, des inquiétudes nombreuses pour le prochain milestone qui est de vacciner 40 de la population d'ici la fin du mois de décembre 2020. Donc, nous espérons que les, les conclusions du sommet d'hier, le sommet global sur la vaccination d'hier, vont accélérer les efforts des pays à recevoir des vaccins 
en, en quantité et en temps voulu pour éventuellement aider les populations à être vaccinées et, et que nos pays puissent atteindre ces objectifs importants fixés par la communauté internationale. Merci. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Richard. Uh, Professor Muyambe, there is a question from uh, Chris from CGTN. Uh, he's asking, when um, will the Madana vaccine be deployed in the DRC? Oui, nous avons déjà reçu, je crois que c'était la semaine passée, nous avons déjà reçu un lot important euh, de vaccins modernes euh, qui est déjà utilisé ici euh, à Kinshasa. Et il reste donc à déployer euh, en province. Et très prochainement, donc, il sera envoyé dans les différentes provinces. Ce que nous voulons également, c'est garder, n'est-ce pas, l'équité. Euh, pas seulement euh, garder les vaccins euh, dans la capitale, mais également, et également dans euh, les provinces et surtout les provinces les plus reculées. Et donc, euh, ça se fera très prochainement. Merci beaucoup, Professor Muyambe. This question is uh, coming to you, Dr. Gitani. The question is uh, from Esther Nakazi. She's asking, uh, what is the shelf life for most of uh, the donations coming to Africa? Um, that you talked about a, lo a long uh, time frame is required. Uh, so what is the ideal time frame? Dr. Gitani, please. Well, thank you very much. And I would like to ask uh, Dr. Mihiko to assist me on this because he's following the tracking the vaccines properly. But what we know is that there are many vaccines and most vaccines will be up to six months, um, you know, expiry or life. But there are many that are landing in Africa with just a month to spare or three weeks to spare. And that's a real challenge because you can imagine, as you've heard Professor Mwembe explain, the Moderna has arrived, it needs to be distributed from the national uh, depot, then we need to go to the regional depots, then go to the facility. That in itself takes time. And then there is vaccination. And in many of the areas in Africa, majority of the populations are rural and some of them may be very far from the health facility. And these vaccines are not amenable to taking them to the people because the cold chain, you know, they are not like polio vaccine that you can actually deliver through community health workers all the way to the doorstep. So people need to come to the facility so far And that means that uh, you have to mobilize people coming from very far. So this is why we are saying for our health system, a delivery mechanism, it needs the absorptive capacity requires uh, is suboptimal and therefore requires long dated uh, vaccines. This is really the issue we need to address. And I don't think we should receive vaccines that are less than two months uh, to expiry. Uh, I don't think it will be optimal, but I'm sure Dr. Mihigo has probably a more scientific answer than this. Dr. Mihigo, please. Uh, yeah, um, Dr. Gita is right. Unfortunately, this has been a, a quite a very tricky situation. Um, uh, when we did an al analysis on the uh, um, uh, average in terms of shelf life for most of the vaccines that are coming uh, as a donation, unfortunately, this range between two to three months uh, on average. This is quite very short, and we've heard um, Professor Muyembe saying about the, um, the trust that this is uh, really uh, Uh, causing uh, in terms of the community that are accepting this, this vaccine. Uh, some countries have even completely refused to receive some of the donation when the short life, the chef life was uh, shorter. Um, um, although we, we have seen countries that have high absorptive capacity that have um, indeed uh, having a lot of challenge, but have accepted that. So in summary, I think uh, uh, what we are asking really uh, the uh, Uh, donating countries is that uh, uh, we have not only vaccine that are uh, uh, extended shelf life, minimum uh, uh, up to six months. Secondly, that we have a minimum of predictability when these vaccines are coming and how, how many doses are going to come. So that will help countries to plan accordingly their campaign, to put in place a deployment plan well in advance uh, before the vaccine arrives. Uh, because most of the time, the news around donation comes uh, in a very short notice. We uh, communicate to countries, are you ready to receive a vaccine in a couple of days? 
And most of the time, countries do not have enough time to prepare for that. So I think to change this paradigm, we will need really a bit more predictability in terms of number of doses, how many doses are, are coming, and when they are coming to help countries to plan uh, accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mihigo. Uh, uh, I have an additional question for you. Are there extra efforts by African governments to get more vaccine after uh, outside the COVAX uh, arrangement? No, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, if we looked at the number of uh, uh, vaccines that have arrived in Africa, we are around 180 million doses that have uh, arrived in Africa. And uh, so far, vaccines that, uh, that have came through the COVAX facility are around 60, 65 million only. So the vast majority of the vaccine came through either bilateral deeds by the country themselves or bilateral donation uh, between uh, countries uh, on Africa. So there is a lot of efforts that countries are doing in parallel of the uh, uh, COVAX uh, mechanism. Uh, but what, ex again, we, we would like to see it's um, uh, the increase of these numbers of doses, the predictability, and we hope to see uh, the number of vaccines that are going to come through the AVAT platform, which is the AU-led uh, uh, initiative, also to increase quite very quickly so that we can um, uh, augment the capacity of country to deploy vaccine. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Richard. The next question is coming to you, Dr. Balde. So the question is, how much have other health issues like uh, malaria, cholera, and other outbreaks uh, being affected because of uh, the attention that has been shifted to the COVID-19 response? Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And uh, thanks for the question. I think uh, that question was also asked last week. And definitely, we know that this is uh, really a major burden. I mean, the COVID-19, given the scope and also uh, the all of the magnitude of the pandemic in Africa, is really mobilizing all of the different resources. I mean, health resources, public health resources for responding to this pandemic. We have seen it during the third wave. And while uh, responding to this pandemic, we have also faced many other challenges, many other emergencies currently which are ongoing uh, recently we just closed the ebola evd uh, outbreak in uh, guinea but also uh, the marburg uh, outbreak uh, again i mean equally in guinea but we are the humanitarian crisis where we have a major component in terms of uh, public health so for sure i think uh, the trade-off and the balance between i mean sharing all of the available resources for responding timely and effectively to these different emergencies is really a major challenge. So this can create a kind of tension to our health system, I mean, to our capacities to respond to all of these different uh, uh, emergencies. However, we have to say, I mean, a lot of uh, actions are ongoing today, like for instance, like in DRC with the meningitis outbreak in the Chopo province, I mean, uh, we are trying to respond to that one with the, by supporting obviously the national health authorities of DRC. Same thing for the Tigray, I mean, the, the humanitarian crisis in Tigray, the situation in Madagascar, with the malnutrition situation in Madagascar. So uh, just to conclude, in average, usually we have more than 100 public health emergencies occurring in Africa, I mean, in a yearly basis. So this is, I mean, coming just in addition, I mean, to this situation. So definitely it's really a major tension and as an implication, definitely more engagement and more, more capacities, I mean, to respond effectively, timely and concomitantly to all of these different emergencies is something which is really important. And we call upon obviously all of the different organizations, agencies, and also obviously the national health authorities, I mean, to put our hands together, you know, for really, uh, I mean, uh, uh, using uh, all of these, uh, I mean, limited resources, I mean, adequately. Uh, thank you and back to you, uh, Mary. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Valde. Yes, the DRC is indeed a very good example of a country dealing with COVID and so many other emergencies. Uh, Professor Muyambe, do you want to weigh in on this? How is uh, DRC managing to deal with all these emergencies in addition to uh, the COVID-19 response? Bon, nous avons en RDC une grande expérience. Nous avons une grande expérience pour euh, aborder toutes ces crises. Euh, euh, quand vous avez une crise euh, d'Ebola qui dure euh, trois mois, six mois, on étouffe un peu les autres activités. 
surtout, n'est-ce pas, les activités de, n'est-ce pas, du PEV. Et vous aurez donc la résurgence euh, des épidémies de, de rougeole, hein, de rougeole, de choléra, etc. Et Mais ce que nous faisons actuellement, c'est euh, d'intégrer intégrer donc notre lutte contre la COVID dans les systèmes de santé, c'est-à-dire nous remettons ça au niveau des zones de santé. Et les zones de santé vont donc travailler en tenant compte des autres maladies euh, euh, comme les palures, comme la rougeole, qui sévissent, n'est-ce pas, dans les zones de santé. Donc tout cela est intégré et nous faisons donc une activité multisectorielle. Notre réponse est multisectorielle de sorte que euh, les autres ministères participent également et euh, font tout pour qu'on euh, n'oublie on, on, on pas les maladies euh, endémiques euh, qui, sont en fait, euh, qui sont en fait les principales causes de mortalité et de morbidité, n'est-ce pas, dans la population. C'est donc en tenant compte de ça. Donc, il faut que vraiment notre réponse soit incrustée n'est-ce pas, dans le, dans le système de santé et surtout donc au niveau des zones de santé. Voilà un peu comment nous voyons les choses. À vous. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mouyambe. Dr. Benido, do you want to wear on this question, please? Dealing with COVID and other emergencies. Well, I think the, the, the reality here is while all countries are experiencing this COVID-19 and responding to the COVID-19, there are other health emergencies and uh, other public health matters that are going on. And uh, like Baldi was saying, if we take uh, the example of DRC, Guinea and uh, other countries, they are experiencing, in addition to COVID, other public health emergencies being meningitis uh, in DRC. And recently, uh, it was Marburg in uh, Guinea and then plague in uh, Madagascar. So clearly, there, there's an impact on, of COVID on the response to some of these events. But the good news is, uh, with the experience countries have acquired in preparing for and responding to acute public health events in the region, we are closely working with them to ensure that while addressing the COVID-19 response, we also focus on other uh, uh, emergencies. One of the typical example is like what is happening in DRC with the meningitis, where we have been able to closely work with uh, uh, Professor Muyembe's team and the MOH to deploy a number of experts uh, who are closely working with them in Mar in. Uh, in Guinea, for instance, uh, uh, some funds were made available for what, what we call our contingency uh, fund for emergency. So I think the key message here is, yes, we are really busy working on COVID-19, but let us not forget other public health priority in the region and make sure that we, we also address them uh, in a manner that deserves uh, the attention of uh, WHO, member states, and our key partners. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moy, uh, to Dr. Benido, sorry. Um, yes, it is indeed important to address all the different emergencies uh, because we could have mortalities from other emergencies, even more than uh, COVID as well. So the next question is to you, um, Dr. Richard. It's coming from Ismail Kabuyaya uh, from Congo Unicom. How long do the various vaccine side effects last? Should those who already had two doses expect a third dose like um, they are doing in some uh, European countries? What is the vaccination rate in Africa? So you go first and then Professor Muyambe can uh, complement. Okay, thank you, uh, Mary. Um, well, I think we, uh, on the first point on uh, side effect, uh, I think what we have seen with the uh, um, pharmacovigilance system that we have established uh, in collaboration, of course, with member states uh, when the vaccine started to be deployed, uh, and the, the data that uh, are being collected, that's in the vast majority of the case, 
uh, the side effects that are following immunization are, are very mild. Uh, these are small pain at the place of injection, uh, a little bit of uh, some fever, which usually disappear in the next 24 to 48 hours um, after the, the vaccination. So I think uh, in the vast majority uh, of the, the case, this is the, the situation. Um, and uh, uh, we are more and more uh, data that is showing um, a very good safety record uh, for most of the vaccines that have received WHO authorization uh, uh, for emergency uh, use. Now, with regards to the uh, uh, two dose, uh, for those who have already received two dose, again, here um, it, it's very important to note that uh, uh, with the vaccine effectiveness data that are now coming uh, from the field, after the deployment uh, of the current vaccine, we are showing that those who have been completely vaccinated are more likely uh, to not get to not get uh, the severe form or even when they are hospitalization. So it protects them really against uh, those uh, severe outcome of the disease. And there is no um, uh, uh, evidence for the moment to say that people who are uh, fit, who are in good health, that they need a third dose. So there are more and more data that's showing that the third dose could potentially be uh, uh, given to the people who are um, uh, either having some issues of uh, immuno uh, uh, are immunocompromised or for some of the elderly where we know that uh, the vaccination immunity could win uh, with, with the, the, the time, particularly when they are in contact with uh, some of these uh, new variants. So in conclusion to this, we are more and more, we are continuing to advocate for people to receive the full course of vaccination because this is what will protect them against severe disease and hospitalization. And then finally, with regards to the rates, uh, vaccination rate, we are still very far, very far. If you recall the question by the uh, colleague from Frank in French, we say that only uh, 14 countries as of today have reached 10% of their population. On average in Africa, um, only 4% of the people have received the two doses uh, of, of the vaccine. So we are, we are really very far to reach the ideal uh, coverage rate that one could expect. And we hope that in the coming weeks with the uh, number of doses that are going to increase, we may accelerate the pace of vaccination to protect as many people as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Richard. Dr. Gita, he, do you want to weigh in on this question? Looking at uh, the dosages, can we take to, uh, the third dose? What is it that we need to do in Africa? Professor Muyambe, I will come back to you with another question. Dr. Yeah. Gita, he, please. Thank you, Dr. Murray. I think the first thing to say on the, what uh, uh, Dr. Richard has talked about is over 6 billion doses or close 6 billion doses have been given across the world and there has been no crisis of side effects. If there were major side effects, by now would have known, you know, 6 billion doses is a huge number. You'd have expected, you know, if uh, as the disinformation is going around saying, oh, this is going to do this, and we would have seen it, we haven't. So vaccines are safe. And, uh, you know, reflecting on what uh, Dr. Mihiko has said. The secondly is that we know that um, even where countries have tended to think about giving a third dose, which WHO has discouraged and said, hold on the third dose until everyone has their first and second dose. It's like queuing for food and the person ahead of the queue is going for their third plate of food, but the people behind the queue are still waiting for their first chance to serve their food. So this is what we are saying, let people hold on, let people get their first and second dose. And then when there is enough science of the third dose, that's going to be advisable and policy across the world. And then we can then apply that policy to available resources. But for now, we need to avail the available doses to people to receive their first and second dose. That would be like what I would like to add. OK. And then what, what about your thoughts on the vaccine hesitancy here in Africa in the communities? Well, I think this is a really important question, Dr. Mary, because globally, if you talk to people in rich countries, if you talk Europe and North America, this question keeps coming up. And in my view, this question is being asked by people who actually uh, don't understand that the challenge of vaccines in Africa is not a demand problem. It's a supply problem. And that needs to be the headline. 
that the challenge is that supply issue, not demand. The fact that we have a few pockets of hesitancy, that's, you know, that is expected. And uh, vaccine hesitancy is not an issue of COVID, it's not new. In fact, if you look at hesitancy in some of the countries in the North, uh, it's actually much higher than the countries in the South. We know that in the in US, they're dealing with a huge issue of hesitancy and lack of vaccine uh, acceptance. So I think for us, the headline should be that vaccines should be made available. It's a supply issue. Demand will be overcome for those few people who still have questions through communication, through information, through trusted sources, like now we are doing here, that people listen to trusted sources and they get the right information. So the current, the current problem we have in Africa is actually supply, not demand. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gitahi. And uh, Professor Muyambe, uh, this question is coming from the, uh, the news organization, uh, AFP, uh, about the management of vaccine in remote areas. Are there arrangements uh, made to vaccinate populations living in conflict affected areas, like uh, what DRC did during the Ebola outbreak? Professor Bon voilà, je pense que dans les zones de conflit, euh, nous avons aussi une grande expérience pendant la crise Ebola de 2018-2020. Euh, pour la première fois, nous avons utilisé donc un vaccin qui demandait une conservation à moins 80. Et euh, le vaccin RVSV que nous avons utilisé. Donc, euh, il fallait absolument regarder à moins 80. Et malgré le conflit qui existe euh, à l'est du pays, euh, dans la province du Nord Kivu, Sud Kivu et Ituri, nous avons donc pu euh, vacciner plus de 600 000 personnes. Donc, euh, en utilisant un vaccin euh, qui, qui demandait une conservation comme le, vaccin, euh, comme le vaccin Pfizer ou le vaccin Moderna. Et cela a bien marché. Et maintenant, nous avons cette expérience et nous voulons également euh, introduire le vaccin euh, dans la province du Nord Kivu, qui est en fait la, le deuxième épicentre euh, de la COVID en RDC. Le premier épicentre étant la ville de Kinshasa. Et donc là, nous allons utiliser les différents vaccins. Euh, nous avons opté pour notre, pour notre plan stratégique l'utilisation d'au moins trois vaccins, euh, au moins quatre vaccins, donc euh, AstraZeneca, Moderna, Pfizer euh, et Johnson Johnson. Et si nous utilisons donc le Pfizer, il faut absolument une chaîne de froid de moins 80. Et là, nous pensons, nous avons déjà l'expérience dans cette partie du pays, nous allons donc utiliser ce, ce, ce genre de vaccins. Euh, nous pensons que... Euh, nous avons vraiment euh, eu une grande expérience avec, euh, avec Ebola et n'importe dans n'importe quelle, quelle région de la RDC, nous sommes capables de nous déployer et de vacciner la population. Mais je pense que si nous comparons donc le vaccin COVID avec les autres vaccins que nous utilisons, la population est plus habituée au, au vaccin du PEV. Au vaccin du PEV qui s'adresse vraiment aux enfants. Et nous n'avons pas cette habitude de vacciner les adultes. Et le vaccin COVID arrive au moment où il y a l'infodémie, etc., et qui s'adresse surtout à la population adulte. C'est ça qui fait qu'il y a une méfiance, euh, l'acceptation n'est pas facile, il y a beaucoup d'hésitation. Et nous pensons que si on travaille beaucoup sur, sur ceux qui ont des hésitations, ils peuvent, ils peuvent basculer soit du côté positif, donc ils acceptent le vaccin, soit du côté négatif. Mais euh, l'expérience que j'ai maintenant, je vois que de plus en plus en RDC, surtout ici à Kinshasa, il y a un engouement. Depuis que le président de la République s'est fait vacciner, nous voyons un engouement pour accepter la vaccination. Et nous croyons que dans les jours à venir, toutes les doses que nous allons recevoir seront utilisées, d'autant plus que nous avons euh, développé une expérience 
euh, avec ce que nous avons reçu en première, en première phase. Maintenant, en troisième phase ici, euh, le personnel soignant, je crois que c'est prioritaire. Il faut absolument protéger le personnel soignant et également euh, le personnel euh, euh, de la police et, et la, le personnel militaire qui sont en contact permanent avec la population. Ça, il faut vraiment absolument rendre même cette vaccination obligatoire. Et ici, dans mon institut, euh, nous sommes en, en affaire de 150 agents. Euh, de plus en plus, nous parlons de la vaccination obligatoire pour venir travailler au laboratoire. Voilà un peu euh, comment nous voyons les choses dans l'avenir. Voilà. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Muyambe, for that uh, elaborate answer. Yes, indeed, we can leverage on our experience responding to outbreaks in the past uh, for this COVID-19 response and future outbreaks. So we are coming to the end uh, of this uh, briefing for today. Uh, we will turn back to our panelists for their final uh, words. Um, you have one minute each. I will start with you, Dr. Gitahi, then uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Muyembe, then finally, Dr. Uh, Benido. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, the, the, I would like to conclude by just looking at um, a, uh, you know, a recent study on this issue of vaccine acceptability. And I think this is, we need to, con to speak about vaccine acceptability quite a lot because we have seen people queuing for vaccines. There may be pockets of hesitancy and those are easily overcome by information from trusted sources. In a recent study in Mozambique, the vaccine acceptance was seen to be somewhere around 90%, Sierra Leone around 90%. The lowest out of about 10 countries was Burkina Faso below 70. Of course, I know DR Congo, as Professor Moyembe has mentioned, even in a previous 15 country study, uh, had actually shown a much lower acceptance and this may be related to the experiences of Ebola, trust between the people and their governments and all these things. But when you look at um, countries like Russia, acceptability was seen to be 30%, US 64%. So basically the point I'm making here is let's focus on supply and then make sure we isolate where those pockets of hesitancy are, because again, hesitancy is not absolute. It is a demand, it's a, it's a desire for information and then overcome them through community structures, local leaders, health workers, as we continue to insist on supply and rapid vaccination of our people. That's what I would like to say in closing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gitahi. And uh, Professor Muyambe, your final words, please. Bon, il y, y, y a un point que nous n'avons pas abordé, en fait, c'est la recherche. La recherche va nous orienter s'il faut prendre une troisième dose de vaccin ou pas. C'est-à-dire, dans mon, dans mon institut et également à l'école de santé publique ici à Kinshasa, il y a de plus en plus de recherches sur la séroprévalence, n'est-ce pas, de, de, n'est-ce pas, des anticorps dans la population. Euh, vaccinés et non vaccinés pour voir exactement ce qui se passe. Et ceci est très important pour nous pour prendre donc des de, 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 de mesures, n'est-ce pas, de santé publique, euh, s'il faut faire une troisième vaccination ou pas. Tout ça, c'est la recherche qui va, n'est-ce pas, nous dire ce qu'il faut faire, n'est-ce pas, dans l'avenir. Merci. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Muyambe, for that uh, useful addition on the issue of uh, third dose. And now, finally, uh, to you, Dr. Benido, your final thoughts, please. Thank you, Mary. Uh, three points. The first one is really on COVID-19 uh, vaccination uh, and vaccines. I think there's a need to accelerate the pace of vaccination in uh, the region. Uh, we should also take advantage of the ongoing momentum and uh, uh, global momentum to ensure that we can accelerate the pace of uh, vaccination. We'll be closely working with uh, our donors and partners to ensure that more doses can reach uh, uh, our countries. The second aspect is really the uh, fact that there are quite a number of other 
health emergencies that are going on in the region, including uh, dengue, dengue, plague, and so on. So our member states and partners should be closely working together to ensure that while responding to COVID-19, we also closely look at what is happening in other uh, uh, health areas, and then we address any gaps uh, uh, we'll be seeing. And then lastly, it's really the issue of healthcare workers, which was uh, uh, also raised here. Uh, we need to make sure that they have uh, uh, what they require in terms of PPEs, trainings, and vaccination, as well as information that can help them uh, better perform and uh, save lives. So these are like the three uh, points I I'll convey here. And I'd like also to really take this opportunity on behalf of Dr. Moiti to thank uh, uh, Dr. Gitahi, to thank Professor Muyembe and all uh, 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 our colleagues journalists who have taken time out of their busy schedule to attend this briefing session. Once again, many thanks to you on behalf of uh, WHO Regional Office for Africa. Back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Benido. Uh, a very big thank you to all, including yourself and the journalists, all our panelists. Thanks for the excellent work everyone is doing. It's a busy time, it's a challenging time, but we all have uh, contributions and roles to play. So thanks everyone, thanks to our journalists, thanks to the panelists once again. See you next week. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Merci, au revoir. Au revoir.